Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone, and welcome to your bronies class. Um, this is a slightly odd experience for me, and I'm sure it is for you too. I've never tried to do an audio version of a lecture before. Um, I'm a little sad that we can't do this in person because it's an incredibly interesting topic, and I think that you guys would have a huge amount of valuable stuff to add to it um, that I haven't necessarily thought of before. But unfortunately, this is where we are right now, so let's make the best of it. So what I'm going to be doing during this audio recording is I will try and go through some of the big ideas that I would have covered in the physical lecture. And at times, I'll point to certain slides in the PDF of the PowerPoint or certain videos that I've uploaded that you can watch that will help to back up the information that I'm giving you. If at any point you get lost, you can always stop and go back, which is the good part about having an audio lecture. And of course, as always, you are very welcome to email me any comments or queries or questions that you might have about this material. Quite obviously, you should start listening to this audio lecture on slide one of the PDF, which is the introductory slide. So what we're talking about today, in context of the theme of this week, which is around gender and social slash digital media. What we're talking about today is we're talking about a very particular iteration of male fandom and male fan communities online. What these mean, how people respond to them, what the consequences of these forms of fandom are for our imagining of gender. So I want you to keep in mind very strongly the stuff that we were talking about yesterday when we discussed Judith Butler and her notion of performativity, of performative gender, of gender as a social construct, something that we are all collectively involved in constantly making and remaking on a daily basis. So yesterday we were talking about the way in which we collectively agree on something called femininity and then police the way that certain types of people embody that. Today we're going to be having the same conversation around masculinity and taking it in a slightly different direction. You can now move on to the next slide. So my question for you when we start off here would be, can anyone define the notion of hegemony? Does anyone know what hegemony means, what it implies? Sometimes um, pronounced hegemony. Um, we can argue endlessly about the correct pronunciation, but fortunately none of us speaks ancient Greek, so we'll never really know. The quote that I've given you comes from a very useful website called Marxists.org, which you can check out if you're interested in finding out more about this stuff. They give really good summaries and definitions of some of the major notions within Marxist thought. So when we talk about hegemony, we're talking about an idea that comes from a theorist called Antonio Gramsci, an Italian theorist, an Italian Marxist anarchist, who wrote a book called The Prison Notebooks, in which he outlined many of the important ways in which we currently think about hegemony. So according to Marxists.org, Gramsci defines hegemony as a system of class alliance in which a hegemonic class exercised political leadership over subaltern, meaning lower status, in effect, classes by winning them over. So what's really significant here is the act of winning over, right? We're not talking about rule by force. We're not talking about rule by military or domination. We're not talking about sending large groups of police onto campuses and forcing students to do particular types of things by using military or other might or power. We're talking about rule by consent. We're talking about people internalizing norms and rules and laws and behaving in these ways in a way that seems as though it's by choice. Gramsci calls this the manufacture of consent, right? So the way that control cultures work is they basically convince us to police ourselves. They convince us that certain type of systems are hegemonically normal and because they're normal we all just do them which is related to what we were talking about yesterday. Because certain modes of feminine performance are seen as being normal, we all just do them, and those of us who don't do them are somehow seen as being abnormal. And this isn't policed by a load of uh, dudes in an office somewhere going, right, this is how we're going to run the patriarchy this year. This is stuff that we do ourselves. We consent to it. This common consent is manufactured by hegemonic systems. 
So this is an idea that's extremely important for Marxist thought. One hegemony often stamps out other alternative ways of being or thinking. Hegemony involves a culture's way of seeing its belief patterns, and really importantly, it also very often involves the institutions that hold this up. So where do we learn this stuff? Where do we learn what is considered, in inverted commas, normal? Where do we learn what is hegemonically appropriate? We learn this at school. We learn it at university. We are taught it by the state. We see it in the media. We learn it at church. All of these institutions all consistently reiterate to us the appropriate way of behaving, what we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to think. So these institutions help to shore up, to strengthen, to power up hegemony. They endorse the ethical and normative beliefs of a particular culture. And these ethical and normative beliefs of a particular culture may feel completely natural and normal to us, but they also just happen to be perfectly in line with what those who are dominating society say is right. So it's very, very convenient that it's a hegemonic norm for men to run large companies and have significantly more power in global government when the people who run the world are largely male, right? That's basically what we're talking about. It feels normal. Hegemony suggests that it's normal and that it just is. This normativization, this naturalization is one of the most important ways in which hegemony works. So the institutions and beliefs of the dominant culture are extremely powerful and they're usually transmitted to us as children, which makes it hard to imagine an alternative sometimes. So a good example of this in the history of South Africa is separate development. You know, white people growing up in the 1960s, 1970s and 1980s did not see apartheid as racist. They saw it, they were taught, obviously some of them did, But they were taught not to classify it as racist. They were taught to classify it as separate development that would allow all different population groups to grow at their own speed. They were taught to classify it as something that was really progressive and positive, which is why so many of them were so taken aback when the country exploded. You know, these are ideas that are hegemonically transmitted to us from a very, very young age. And unless we question them and query them and critique them, it's very easy for us to just sit back and go, oh, well, that's just normal. It just is. Language as well plays a huge part in hegemony. The words that we use generally condition us to certain specific behaviors. So how does this notion of hegemony relate to what we want to talk about today? Well, Today we're really, really interested in something that theorists refer to as hegemonic masculinity. The term was initially devised by the sociologist R.W. Connell, who interestingly, and not relevantly, but interesting considering our discussion yesterday, is actually a trans woman who began writing as, as a man and then transitioned. So R.W. Connell is an Australian sociologist who's very, very good, who wrote a book in 1995 called Masculinities and discussed hegemonic masculinity. So hegemonic masculinity was originally understood or conceived as the set of practices that promote the dominant social position of men and the subordinate social position of women, right? It's used to explain, it was originally used to explain the hegemony of one gender over the other gender. It was used to try and explain why and how men maintain dominant social roles over women So this original definition assumed that masculinity, in inverted commas, was one thing that just existed to assume dominance over women. This notion has now been expanded to understanding masculinities as plural, as a much, much, much broader idea. So masculinity, manhood, is not unitary or stable. It's not just one thing, and we all know what it is, and we all agree what it is. Although, of course, the dominant culture has often tried to suggest that it is just one thing. One of the really important things that Connell did in her work on hegemonic masculinities was she showed the way in which certain forms or modes or performances of masculinity are actually used or actually rather operate to create status and dominance between different types of men. So even though the argument is that all men benefit to some extent from the patriarchy because they are men, Within these masculinities, there are different forms and types of men who benefit in different ways and some who claim dominance over others. You know, this is an argument that becomes really, really interesting if we think about, 
for example, political culture in the U.S. at the moment and the way that um, a lot of political commentators are trying to explain the popularity of Donald Trump. They're saying that, you know, working class white people feel like they've lost power and they feel like they, they have no more status and they've, they're out of control and they want Trump to stand up for them. So the suggestion here actually relates really strongly to notions of hegemonic masculinity, where even though these people have access to whiteness and a lot of them have access to masculinity, they don't have access to the status that they think that they should deserve because their form of masculinity, because they are poorer whites, their form of masculinity is no longer hegemonic. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. This is slide three. This is a quote from Connell's own website. I've given you the link there. You can take a look at it if you're interesting, interested. rather. Or, of course, you can go and read some of her articles or books. The articles are all available um, via the Wits Library, and we have some of her books in our library as well. So Connell says that to speak of masculinities is to speak about gender relations. Masculinities are not equivalent to men. They concern the position of men in a gender order. They can be defined as the patterns of practice by which people, both men and women, though predominantly men, engage that position. There's abundant evidence that masculinities are multiple with internal complexities and even contradictions. Also that masculinities change in history and that women have a considerable role in making them in interaction with men and boys. So that, I think, is really, really, really important. This is not just about going, you know, this is hegemonic and this is how men behave and this is why it's problematic. Women are equally complicit in shoring up this system of privilege and of masculinity. Like some of the women that we were talking about yesterday, when people were being really critical of, of Caitlyn Jenner and her mode of kind of depoliticized, super privileged, um, you know, wealthy, white femininity and I was saying well if we're going to critique her we need to critique other women as well there are plenty of women and plenty of very public women in the political sphere whose perspectives we would consider to be anti-feminist and who shore up these ideas of hegemonic masculinity who have a sense about gender order that men must behave in certain ways and women must behave in certain ways so what Connell is really pumping with this talk about gender order is the notion that gender is not only constructed but also structural so all these different modes and forms and performances of gender all constantly interrelate to each other and we make them, we performatively make them on a daily basis. So hegemonic masculinity is structural, it is performative, and it is positional. So a question that I would ask you guys, if we were all in the same room but were not, is what are the characteristics of the sort of ultimate hegemonic masculinity? And some of the things that we say about the, the ultimate expression of hegemonic masculinity, um, that there are physical and emotional characteristics. So physically, of course, this, this ultimate man, this ultimate hegemonic man is heterosexual. He is able-bodied. He's white. He, is, he has access to capital, so he's middle class or wealthy. He's physically fit. Um, he's very often a father as well and a husband, so he's relationally functional. On an emotional level, hegemonic masculinity is, also, is often related to violence. It's often tough and non-emotional, but also highly, highly moral and ethical. So it's this idea of this kind of heroic man who's not at the mercy of his emotions because he's beyond emotions. He's better than that. He's stronger than that. He's fundamentally this man who is physically, emotionally, and morally strong. So we would, you know, we need to think about how and whether this works in South Africa. How is the notion of hegemonic masculinity affected by race? Because, of course, white men are not hegemonic in the current South African system. Um, I have a very good master's student who's doing an amazing project at the moment about three forms of hegemonic masculine display in the South African political sphere, right? And these forms of hegemonic masculinity, which suggests, you know, the, the fluid nature of masculinities, appeal to different publics. So you get the patriarch embodied by Jacob Zuma, 
You get the freedom fighter, embodied by Julius Malema, and you get the intellectual, embodied by Musi Maimani. Whether or not these men actually are those people, each one of them is discursively drawing on a very particular and recognizable version of hegemonic masculinity in order to shore up their own power position status and the power position and status of the parties that they represent. So we could also think about what are the non-hegemonic forms of masculinity. Obviously gay men are very much non-hegemonic form of masculinity, although that does change in some iterations of popular culture. You know, the kind of thing that people refer to as homonormativity, when you have pop culture forms that feature same-sex couples where both people are white and wealthy and middle class, and they basically replay the ultimate heteronormative couple, they just do it as two men. And we can kind of process that now as a, as a, as a culture, and it can be seen to be hegemonic. Other types of non-hegemonic men are potentially geeks, right? Geek culture is very much about rejecting mainstream notions of hegemony, although, of course, as we'll see, it has its own hegemonic forms within itself. Notions of around metrosexuals and men, as we discussed again yesterday, it used to be less hegemonic and less culturally appropriate for men to groom than it is now, so that's a shift that's happened. Stay-at-home fathers are also really, really quite interesting because there is hegemonic power attached to the notion of fathering, but only in certain ways. So that's also a cultural shift that we're seeing at the moment. So hegemonic masculinity is not something that I think anyone actually really has, right? It's not something that any single man can properly embody, not even Arnold Schwarzenegger, because, you know, he has a strange accent and he's not really American. Um, the hegemonic masculinity is the idea, it's the notion of the ultimate man that structures gender relations, structures male and female behavior, structures patriarchy. It's something that men can access and benefit from, but it's something that also alienates them. It's something that men are meant to be able to pull off, but most can't fulfill all of those criteria. So it's a culturally idealized form of masculinity, and it depends on non-hegemonic masculine forms to legitimize itself. So it's not just about contrasting masculinity to femininity. It's not just about going men are dominant to women, over women rather. It's also about going men, certain types of men dominate other types of men. So re really importantly, it has different types of effects on different type of men who try to either fit in with it or reject it or ignore it or work within it. So one of the really interesting things about male popular cultural fandom is that it has the capacity to disrupt hegemonic masculinity. It's often explicitly designed to disrupt hegemonic masculinity, to go with different kinds of men to that kind of men. And this is very different to the way in which other types of male fandom work. And I'm not for a second suggesting that this applies to absolutely everyone in absolutely every instance, but lots of male fandom around sports, for example, operates in a way that strengthens notions of hegemonic masculinity instead of subverting or undermining them. So another question that I would ask you guys, if we were in the same class, if we were in the same room, something that you can perhaps think about, and maybe we can discuss at some stage, is how do you individually feel that hegemonic masculinity has affected your lives, if you feel that it has? And this applies to men and women in equal measure. So now that we have a clear understanding of what hegemonic masculinity is, we are going to move on to discussing the actual topic for today. Please click forward onto slide four. Um, which, as you will see, has pictures of two really, really significant television series, particularly significant to me because that's my era, and I really hope you guys know what I'm talking about, because if, if you've never heard of these, I'll be incredibly depressed. So <laughs> as we discussed, as you discussed in your second year module, in the, your second year, I think it was the first half last year that you did with Viraj and Vidya, Fandom is not just about liking something, it's about actively loving it and becoming involved in it. It's a fairly modern phenomenon in this way. Um, it applies to Star Wars as much as to My Little Pony. It's fundamentally gendered. We're conditioned to like certain things and 
there's often a strange response when we count, when we move across those gender boundaries when it comes to what we like and what we respond to. It's important when we consider pleasure to think about, when we consider fandom rather, to think about pleasure, to think about what do we get from the experience of being involved with this cultural product? What does it do for us? And one of the big arguments that critics make around fandom is that it shows the agency of media consumers in that people pass stuff around, they make work in response to things that they love. They get involved. It's a beautiful way of looking at the audience as an active participant in the making of culture. So the two images here come from TV shows that were huge in the 90s, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and The X-Files. And these really are, in a way, the ground zero of contemporary fandom research because these shows had long-running, ongoing consequences. They had lives in different spaces in ways that no one had ever seen before and no one had really expected. So they've also, you know, importantly, they feature female characters with lots of, lots of agency who are also sexy. They're also objects of desire. So they actually create themselves cunningly as available to a dual audience, right? As a, as a woman or as a teenage girl, you can watch Buffy and you can also want to kick some vampire ass. But as a teenage boy, you can watch Buffy and go, wow, she's really hot and cool and I like her. And you can do the same with the X-Files, right? Scully and the X-Files um, had a similar cultural effect where, you know, women wanted to be her and she was also a sex object and she was a powerful female figure who was not entirely objectified, who had a lot of agency and had a lot of significance. And that's part of the reason that these shows kicked off the way that they did. So this is an unexpected fan base. No one expected Buffy to be liked by geeks as much as by girls. No one expected that Buffy was going to create this huge, huge, huge pile of young, weird, interesting sci-fi fans, all these young female fans who popped out of the woodwork, who, you know, popular culture wasn't really aware of before Buffy happened. So teenage girls and teenage boys probably didn't respect, respond to Buffy in the same way. There were many different responses to this text. It's polysemic. It's possible to read it from a number of different angles. These different responses are part of the reason that the fandom around it became so powerful. So cultural objects that do gain enormous numbers of fans are often polysemic. They often allow for plura plur rather plurality of readings and for various different imagined communities to coalesce around them. So at this point, I want you to stop this audio lecture and spend a couple of minutes watching the videos that I've uploaded, either video number one or video number two, or if you're really loving it, you can watch both, or you can just go online and look at any My Little Pony Friendship is Magic video. I want you to have a look at these videos for a few minutes. You don't have to watch the whole thing. So you get some sense of what the show is that is the object of the fandom that we're interested in in this class. Okay, uh, I hope you watched those, I hope you enjoyed them, and I hope you are paying attention to the fact that this is the only department at Fitz that makes you watch My Little Pony. Um, so what we're interested in today is a My Little Pony fandom culture. You should already know about this from having read the readings, which of course you've all read, but we're talking about a My Little Pony fandom culture that is largely centered around men, it's called the brony, they're called bronies, right? Bronies are bros who like ponies. So the, what the brony subculture does is it allows male fans of this TV show, which is all full of love and friendship and beautiful things and rainbows and unicorns and color and niceness. And this is, of course, this is a show designed for, you know, pre-adolescent girls. But what the brony subculture does is it allows male fans to create a community where they can appreciate and emphasize non-hegemonic masculinity qualities. They can emphasize things like friendship, gentleness, caring, love, niceness, all elements that popular culture commonly associates with femininity, not masculinity. And what they can do is they can say, no, we don't want this. We don't want to be that kind of man. We don't want to be men who are violent and men who are angry 
and men who are non-emotional and men who are full of muscles. We want to be nice. We want to be. We want to skip through fields and we want to wear pretty colours. And you know what? Damn you, we like pink, and we like sparkles and we like rainbows. They sound like me on the weekends. Um, so the origins of Brony World come from adult men insisting that they respond to the overwhelming themes of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, the TV series, that they also prioritize the qualities that the show prioritizes. So they're basically shunning hegemonic masculinity in favor of newer models of masculinity. Now, of course, I'm talking about a kind of an idealized version of brony culture, as, I'll sh- as, as we'll discuss in a sec. There were also much darker sides to it, but this is what it initially came out of. This idea that men shouldn't have to behave this way, that men can also like nice things, and that it's okay. And, you know, in the same way that we were talking yesterday about who owns certain modes of femininity, why do girls own pink? Why do girls own sparkles? And why do girls own friendship? And why do they own caring? So that's what we're talking about, right? That's where brony culture comes from. And you can see why this might get a lot of people's backs up and why a lot of people might respond to this really negatively. So if you now move on to slides five and six, you'll see um, some My Little Pony brony fan art that I've pulled off the internet. Um, The first slide, slide five, has a cutesy little drawing of a My Little Pony as Doctor Who. So there's a nice moment of cultural convergence of two really highly adored television products there. And then the second one is just a cute little picture of a pony on a couch talking about its feelings. Now, obviously, that doesn't come from the TV show because this is a TV show that is designed for little girls. There is no psychoanalysis in the My Little Pony TV show. So someone's drawn this up because they think, you know, shame ponies have feelings, too. The next slide is a bit less, the next slide, slide six, is a bit less about bronies making art about the show than it is about brony culture itself. So on the top you see a picture of um, a lovely, sweet, sparkling, cute, pink, beautiful brony and a non-brony who's just a curmudgeon and is ugly and is mean and is depressed and is sad. So it's this, it's this kind of knocking together of, you know, people whose subculture allows them to experience joy and the people that they think are against them, who they think of as being joyless and boring and old and sad and miserable. And the next picture is obviously a piece of art that somebody's made to express how much they adore and how committed they are to the subculture. It's all magic and beautiful and sparkly and great. So people take this stuff really, really, really seriously. If you go and do a Google search for Brony fan art, you will find thousands upon thousands upon thousands of images and texts and stories that you can have a look at. Of course, like most subcultures, brony subculture has a number of elements to it and it also has a side that some people really don't like. Here you can shift on to slide seven. So slide seven has got two examples of the ways in which some people in brony subculture really, really, really sexualize My Little Pony, that My Little Pony is in fact a sexual fetish object. Now, this is problematic for certain people for a lot of reasons. Um, I have a very good friend who has a three-year-old daughter who absolutely loves My Little Pony. So much. It's her favorite thing in the whole world. And my friend is having a constant war with her daughter because all her daughter wants to do is go on YouTube and look for videos of My Little Pony. But a lot of the videos that come up when you search that are brony videos featuring My Little Pony characters having really, really, really graphic, sometimes really kind of unusual SM based sex. So my friend is in a constant war to um, purify the culture that her child can imbibe. So her child is absolutely allowed to get the original texts, but so much of the fan material associated with the original text is inappropriate for children. So she has to do this constant act of moderating the internet because, you know, YouTube is a really free space. There's a lot of stuff on there that comes without warnings and that's easily accessible. So this notion of sick bronies as people who sexualize ponies, this has actually become the stereotype of the entire subculture. That's something that began as a way of, of trying to undermine hegemonic masculinity and create spaces where men could relate to each other in different, more affective, emotional ways, has been stereotyped as a space that exists entirely for perverts and weirdos. 
And this should be familiar to you from our discussion yesterday because it's really similar to some of the arguments around transgender men where certain radical feminist thinkers are going, we shouldn't, we can't allow these people into women's bathrooms or women's spaces or women's prisons because they will just rape us all because they're just perverts. They're just violent, sexually aggressive men who use their identity as trans women or their subculture as bronies to just express this perverse, gross, disgusting sexuality. So both bronies and transgender women are often culturally described as examples of the depravity of men, the sickness, the pathology, the weirdness, the the problem of men who misperform masculinity, who don't perform masculinity appropriately. And, you know, for me, I think this is really significant because what it suggests is one of the ways in which the hegemony polices itself, right? Men who don't perform hegemonic masculinity or who explicitly reject hegemonic masculinity are stereotyped and characterized as being pathological, weird, violent, sick. And yes, there may be some cases where these things are true. And yes, it might be a bit weird and a little bit disturbing that adult men are sexually fetishizing a cute cartoon designed for three and four year old girls. But I don't think that that equates to the way the entire subculture is aggressively written off. Right. So I think that responses to bronies, which we'll come back to in a second, are also a really good example of the way that hegemonies police themselves. So if you go and look on slides eight and nine, you'll see some examples of brony performance. Um, of course, all of the fan art that exists, exists online, right? These are all social media and digital media communities. And interestingly, these social media and digital communities then shift into the real world space as a consequence of their existence on social media. So the pictures that you see in slide eight are from various fan conventions featuring bronies or featuring other science fiction or pop cultural characters in which people get involved and dress up as My Little Pony characters. Um, slide nine is two images of people who take the brony aesthetic forward in their own personal lives and you think that this is really cute and fun. You know, that's actually a brony wedding and then there's a hipster brony. Um, so... A subculture that exists on the internet, that exists in the digital media space, actually metamorphosizes into something that exists in the real world space. So it's a, it's a beautiful example of how imagined communities that develop around fandoms and that develop around identities and that develop around cultural products in the online space then become real communities because people are actually physically brought together. People collectively organize themselves so that they can make their imagined community into a community that has a real face, that has a real geographical and physical presence, even if that's temporary. What's also significant about the bronies, um, you know, they have a very, very strong online presence, and then they have things like conventions, groups, and events that come into real life. Brony culture shows the power of social media to create new spaces that allow for freedom and gender subversion. So in this sense, social media is, digital media is almost behaving as a space of freedom, this kind of utopian space of freedom that we've talked about throughout this class, this idealized utopian space of freedom. It's become a phenomenon, it's, it's spread, there are films about it. I gave you a link in your course reader to a full length movie about the brony subculture, a documentary that's very interesting if anyone wants to get hold of it. So it does suggest the power and the ability of the online space to create these, these places where subversion of gender can happen, right? And reconceptualization of gender can happen and the undermining of gender hegemonies can happen. But there are some things that counter this idealization. So firstly, there's Pegasisters, right? Pegasisters are women, adult female fans of My Little Pony. And Pegasisters are often aggressively and quite nastily excluded from brony spaces, right? Where bronies will go, no, 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 you can, we don't want women in here. Even though the cultural product that they're attaching themselves to is something that's 
originally designed for females and even though the way in which they're subverting hegemonic masculinity is by drawing on modes of behavior performance and feeling that are often associated with femininity they're also going no 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 get out there's no space for women here so this should be you know this should should bring back a lot of thoughts about some of the stuff that we talked about yesterday firstly the female drag queen video that i showed you and secondly a brief discussion that we touched on about misogyny among gay men so it may seem ostensibly as though there's this beautiful variety of gender and possibility that's emerging in the online space but there's still this strange policing that exists. Oh, okay, sorry about the break. I think there might have been some minor technical difficulties there, but hopefully the recording is still working and still going on. Um, and hopefully you're still following. Okay, so at this point, um, I would like to start talking about the final thing that we're gonna discuss in this lecture, which is anti-fandom, right? Anti-fandom is a whole different mode of dealing with and discussing fandom. So we're talking here about the policing of fandom, right? The policing of these people, the shaming of these people, the way in which brony fandom is seen to be kind of disgusting and gross and weird and inappropriate. So policing of fandom happens in two ways. Firstly, it happens via exclusion. So certain types of people are excluded from liking certain types of things. You are told that you are not allowed to like this because this thing is for girls or it's for guys. You know, you're not allowed to like Star Wars if you're a girl because it's for guys, which, you know, isn't really the case anymore. But it was when I was growing up. You're not allowed to like My Little Pony if you're an adult man because it's for girls. So firstly, there's exclusion. Secondly, there's mockery. People who like X are idiots, creeps or weirdos. So related to the brony phenomenon, there's also another online subculture called Twi Guys. And Twi Guys are guys who like Twilight, right? They like the story, they like the narrative, whatever their reasons are, they like the Twilight. That is, their object of fandom is the Twilight series. And Twi Guys are often, ex often exposed to enormous amounts of mockery. How can you like this silly, ridiculous, stupid thing? You know, you're a man, what's wrong with you? So we see both exclusion and we see mockery. Now, at this point, I would like you to stop the audio recording again and to go back into your Sakai and get the watch video number three. So this is an online video. This is a video made, it's sort of like fan art, but quite different. This is a video made about bronies by anti-fandom people who are policing people, men who like My Little Pony. So go and have a look at that. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that um, very well-made example of how to stereotype people. <laughs> you can now go on to slide 10. Slide 10 is full of examples of online anti-fandom. So people are making fan art that is specifically about how much they hate other people's fan art, right? It's all... And, the, the fact, you know, up there on the right-hand corner, you can see something that relates to the anti-brony brotherhood. So this is men getting together and going, no, 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 no. These other types of men are not okay. Same with the guy holding the gun. You know, it's there's a way in which certain types of masculinity here are policing other types of masculinity. So this is a this is a quote. Oh, and the fact that one of them that the anti brony coalition banner from Facebook that I've given you comes from Bolivia should give you some sense of how widespread this stuff is. So this is a quote from the main Facebook page of a group that calls itself the anti brony coalition. The anti brony co this somebody's written. I was freaking sick. This is a quote. I was freaking sick of seeing that pony garbage on every site I went to. I had to leave some of my favorite websites because of that scum. I've been exposed to it so much that every time I see the hideous face of an ugly cartoon pony, I see it with anger and hatred. Their creations were scum, trash, garbage. I had no way to get away from it. I didn't like it. That was supposed to be the end of the story. I began to see fanboyism to extremes I'd never seen before between the gore and the perversion. 
claiming it to be their sexual preference of a little girl's cartoon, treating the pa- the fandom ponies and shows if it's their religion, the blatant lies about themselves, how apathetic and hateful they are under the guise of love and tolerance, telling myself and others to kill ourselves for not liking their show, I will never forget, I will never forgive. So clearly this is a rant written by a very angry dude who was operating or spending time on lots of social and digital media spaces where lots of bronies were also spending time and he got into arguments with them and he disliked what they were saying and they disliked what he was saying and it all got very nasty. Now, a discourse analysis of this post would show both exclusion and mockery, right? Both the idea that it's disgusting that these people like what they like because it's not appropriate for them and mockery, these people are idiots, creeps and weirdos, as well as calls to violence. So anti-fandom has the potential to be excessive and to lead to disproportionate reactions just like fandom itself. And then, of course, fandom is likely to protect itself or to respond to this dislike in ways that are also equally excessive and disproportionate. So just as we saw yesterday with the way that radical feminists say horrendous, horrendous things about trans activists on online spaces, and then trans activists are responding or or even coming out with horrendous things themselves, going, kill the TERFs, kill the TERFs. What happens is the the social media space itself, as well as allowing for the creation of these imagined communities, these subversive identities, these interesting ways of rethinking and renegotiating hegemonic gender structures and gender relations, also create these warfares between communities and allow for such disproportionate and violent reactions to each other that they become almost impossible to speak to. Um, Apologies for the break. I just got interrupted by some important information about what's going on on campus. Um, I hope that those of you who are here are being really, really, really careful. And those of you who aren't, we don't need you. I don't need you back until Monday. So, you know, just everyone look after yourselves. Anyway, that's a sideline. So just to finish off this lecture... What we see around the bronies is that two communities are being created. There are those who do like the show and those who don't like the fandom of the show. And dialogue and identity building that happens around both of these online happens in gendered terms. It happens around masculinity. So both of these communities stem from online male subcultures that attack each other. And this is similar to the way in which radical feminists and transgender activists attack each other, right? None of these people are actually attacking hegemonic masculinity. Instead, they're going for each other. So again, it's about internal divisions within potentially subversive identities. So there's a stark disparity that we see in anti-fandom between what's imagined to be okay and what's not imagined to be okay, even though neither of these types of masculinities are hegemonic. Nonetheless, they police each other. So I think they show quite clearly the gradations within masculinity and the claims that non-hegemonic masculinities actually make to hegemonic status when faced with other types of masculinities that may be even less hegemonic than them. So what I've tried to show with this lecture is... Firstly, the way in which hegemonic masculinity and the notions of hegemonic masculinity structure and influence the world that we live in. Secondly, the way that fandoms exist and flourish online and how the online space allows certain types of fan and fandom to create online communities and what bronies as an online fandom try and do in terms of masculinity and masculine hegemonies. And thirdly, I've tried to show the way in which anti-fandom reveals the schisms within these different types of masculinities and the way in which masculinities police themselves and each other. So to go back to the very beginning where we talked about Gramsci and manufacturing consent and 
rule by common consent, right, people who internalize these narratives, the way in which different types of non-hegemonic men attack each other online for their failure to be hegemonic, even though those doing the attacking are also not hegemonic. What's happening there is rule by common consent, right, people shoring up systems of gender that may be oppressive for them, but that they have internalized and naturalized to such an extent that they think that they're normal in the same way that we all think certain ways of dressing are normal for certain people who have certain gender performances. So that is the end of your Bronies lecture. I hope that was helpful. Um, I hope that you guys got something from it and I hope you enjoyed all the pretty pictures. Uh, this is, as I said, it's a slightly strange way to teach and I would much rather be in a room with you getting your thoughts and your feedback because so far you know we've really really had some great discussions in this class but I hope that this will help us to stay on track and not fall behind. In terms of other things that you need to think about firstly um, I really 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 strongly advise you guys to get in touch with the other people in your Tumblr group. The group um, the groups have been posted on Sakai since before this course started. Please find ways to contact each other. You should be able to use Sakai to do that. Um, if you can't, just speak to the people that you know or get in touch with me and I'll see if I can find another way to do it. And I can always email you guys individually if necessary. Secondly, some questions that I've had about the essay. Um, one of the questions I had was about whether and how it influences contemporary society, part of the essay question. So the question was, do you mean that we should discuss how the structures of the chosen object influences society or how the chosen object influences society? And here, because the question of the essay is particularly about structure, I do want you to talk about structure, right? I don't want you to go, this is the structure of Facebook, it works like this, blah, 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 blah. And then when you talk about Facebook's influence on society, to completely ignore the question of structure altogether. So of course you need to talk about how the object itself, how your chosen platform or object influences or responds to or integrates with society and social spaces and social issues. But please, when you do do this, think about it in terms of structure, right? You don't want to just say, you know, Facebook is important because a lot of people use it for to get news. What about the way in which the structure of Facebook uh, organizes how you get news? What about that is important to that news getting function and to how that news getting function influences society? Another question that I've had from someone was, do you have to write the essay on something that we've already covered in class? And the answer to that is absolutely, absolutely not. Um, please don't. I mean, not, not don't. Of course you can if you want to. But please don't feel as though you are restricted to talking or writing about things that we've already covered in class. I want you guys to feel as free as you like, be as creative as you like. You can literally talk about anything. If you cover stuff, your, your marks will actually probably be better if you cover stuff that we haven't dealt with in class, if you go really, really far and come up with something that I haven't thought about before. So don't feel restricted to material that we've already covered. Um, Someone else asked how many different objects you're supposed to talk about, how many different platforms or technologies. The question does ask you to do one, and I would strongly suggest that you do stick with doing one because it's quite hard in an essay of this length to talk in enough detail about more than one platform in a way that's going to really, really get to the meat of it. So I would suggest that you do really focused, concentrated present uh, essays, rather, that talk about your object of interest in a lot of detail, because that's also generally a really good way to get better marks. Um, I am also going to ask you guys to do a Turnitin submission, but you don't have to worry about that yet. I'll open Turnitin later. And um, of course, you need to do the same things that you always do. You need to have a full bibliography. You will be penalized if you don't. The rules are the same as the rules always are. If your essay is not submitted to the essay box outside Merle's office, by midday on the day of submission, you will 
get zero. If you hand it in before 4 p.m., you will lose 10%. Otherwise, you will get zero. There will be no late extensions. There will be no late s admissions. If you come to me and you say, sorry, I can't hand it in, I've got too much work, I will actually just cry a little bit and then say no. That is not a good enough reason, especially since you've all been given an extension. Um, and I expect great things from this class because so far you've been fantastic. So please go and write me some amazing wonderful, exciting, thrilling essays that tell me things I've never even thought about about the social media world that you know way more about than I do. Okay, so that is the end of our very first audio lecture in New Media and Society. Um, and I hope it's been useful to you guys. And I also hope that we'll be back in class next Monday. But let's just keep discussing the situation and we'll see where we go. And whatever happens, I will make sure that you do not fall behind and that you get all the content that you need from this class so that you can all go and write fantastic exams. Oh, and please, 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 if you haven't done so already, don't forget to vote on whether or not you want, whether you want a take-home exam or a sit-down exam. Okay, see you next week. Bye.